Well, one of the things we hope to accomplish through chapel at Wheaton College is opening windows for you into God's work around the world. And I'm thrilled to be able to introduce to you my colleague this morning. Uh, Dr. David Kasali is president of the Christian Bilingual University of Congo. There are lots of connections between Wheaton College and that university through hunger interns who have served there, faculty members who are on their board, uh, through uh, student support of aspects of the Congo initiative there. And we're glad to have Dr. Kasali back on campus uh, this morning, he's spoken here before. We're also glad to have Mrs. Dr. Kasali with us, uh, both of them graduates of Trinity International University. Uh, Dr. Kasali, uh, Mr. Dr. Kasali in New Testament, and uh, Mrs. Dr. Kasali in, uh, in education. I want to tell you that uh, Dr. Kasali had a very prominent career in Africa through his itinerant ministry and also through his presidency of what may be the uh, preeminent evangelical seminary in Africa, the Nairobi Evangelical Graduate School of Theology. But when he saw the way that war was devastating his own native Congo, at the very time that the war was going on, he gathered with other Christian leaders there to say that we need to be working now and laying a foundation for the next generation in Congo. And it was at that time that he left his post in Nairobi uh, to take up the initiative in Congo and now serves as the president of the university there. And I'm hoping on this uh, cold November morning that we can give an African brother a warm Wheaton welcome. Thank you. Jumbo. <clears throat> we greet in uh, East Africa by saying Jumbo. And when we say Jumbo, people respond the same thing. They say Jumbo. So let me hear you now. Jumbo. Jumbo. That uh, makes me feel at home. <laughs> there will be no more tears there. There will be no more death there. It was my privilege this past week to usher Paul's mom to heaven. She had worked and given her whole life to my people in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and many others, men and women who left this country in the early time of the 19th century and 20th century to go and bring the gospel to my people. Many of them knew that uh, maybe they would not come back. And my father was one of those who received the Lord when the first missionaries came to our place. There was a hospital there. Many Africans came to be healed and to die. But many missionaries also came there to get healed and to die. At Oicha, the mission station where I grew up, the symmetry of uh, missionaries who died in my land, many of them from this country, men and women, children and adults. Often when I visit the mission station, I go to that place and read the signs on the tombs and the names of these men and women who left their land. Born in 1930, died in 1940. Born in 1950, died in 1955. And it reminds me that uh, not only Jesus Christ gave his life for me, but men and women from this nation gave their lives to me. And that's why my wife and I are here today. My father never 
imagined that his son would be on the missionary land, teaching the missionary land and the missionary kids. But friends, these are wonderful times. God raised up uh, the sons of Issachar for King David, to whom he gave the gift of reading the signs of the time to know how to respond to the needs of his time. You are the people for this time. You are the people for such a time as this to take the baton that uh, your fathers and mothers, your grandparents have run with and take it and run with it. Are you ready? They said to me, says Jeremiah, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great uh, trouble and disgrace or, and, and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burnt with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, O oh Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands. And toward verse 10 of Nehemiah chapter 1, they, your people, are your servants, your people, whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. O oh Lord, let your ears be attentive to the prayer of this, your servant, and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of these men. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai in chapter 5, 4 of Esther, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows? But you have come to royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my, maid, my maids will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Teach us your word, dear Lord, for we, your people, are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. I entitled our reflection this morning for such a time as this. Throughout history, God, God has been in a business of raising up men and women. 
to do his work, to achieve God's divine goals and purposes in his world. These have been ordinary men and women, people like you and me, who found themselves in different circumstances, in different time, in different space. They were rich and poor, educated and uneducated, young and old. They have been white and black, male and female. Men and women who were and are ready to move with God, to do God thing. Men and women who have completely abandoned themselves in a mighty hand of a mighty God. And by so doing, achieved extraordinary results for the glory of God and for the well-being of human beings and of humanity. My thesis to you and me this morning is that God has not changed. That God who raised up men and women in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, in the history of the church, continues to do that even today to achieve his goals and his purposes around the world. Will we let him? Can we let him? when he calls us. Three things have been common to all these men and women that God has used. Three things. One, these are men and women who said yes to God's calling, regardless of challenges, massive challenges that they faced. Number two, these are men and women who involved God in their mission. And number three, they did not just say yes, they did not just involve God, but they took action. They moved into action and left the result to God. Such is the example of Nehemiah and Esther, a man and a woman that I want to analyze briefly with you this morning. Both of them face stories of challenges, social challenges of their people. Israel had been deported to Babylon. They were refugees in a land they did not know. The city of Jerusalem had been destroyed. Friends, this sounds like my people in Congo. This sounds like my country in Congo, where men and women continually run away from their villages and their cities, away to places that are difficult, leaving their jobs and their shambles they are filled behind. It's not a pleasant situation. But the people of God found themselves in such a situation as this. Number one, they said yes to God's calling, regardless of massive danger and challenges that face them. In Nehemiah, we read, when I heard these things, that Jerusalem is broken, that, that Jerusalem is destroyed, and the gates are burnt with fire, and people are in trouble and shame, I sat down and mourned and fasted. Yes, 
starts with a deep identification with the people. Yes, starts with the heart that feels the compassion for people who have been going through injustice. We cannot say yes unless God has touched our hearts, unless we can feel what people are feeling. I sat down, says Nehemiah, and wept. I cannot pray for my country without weeping. I cannot see the situation of my people without being broken. While working in uh, the Nairobi Evangelical Graduate School of Theology in uh, Kenya, my country was going through a horrible time. My brother died and my younger sister died. Suddenly, the world changed for me. The theological perspective changed for me. Where is God when people suffer? How can people who are suffering believe that God loves them? How can God make it believable to them that he's good? Friends, I want to suggest to you that God's answer is none but you and me. God does not have any plan B, but you and me being the light of the world, the salt of the world. And when we come to that, identify with what people are going through and feeling it the way they feel, being touched by the situation, then Nehemiah says, Send me, in chapter 2, verse 5. Send me so that I can go and rebuild. And Esther says, I will go. If I perish, I perish. But before Esther did that, she had to wonder it is the law that nobody should go before the king if not called. And it's 30 days that I have not been called. How can I go before the king when I'm not called? When can I go when 30 days have passed without the king called me? Before saying yes, they are always doubted in our hearts. And this has been in the history of uh, men and women God wanted to use. Moses said, God, I cannot go. Send someone else. Jesus told the disciples, feed the 5,000. And the disciples said, no, we don't have money. It will take salary of eight months to feed them. Always excuses. I cannot go to Congo. It's dangerous there. I'm OK at Wheaton College. I'm okay in my suburban place. We eat a lot of beans and, uh, and, and, and maize and put them together there and that's our hamburger. <laughs> I cannot leave my hamburger and chicken wings. <laughs> Whenever I come to America, I say, the first thing, I want chicken wings. They said yes to God because they saw the situation of the people. They believe in, in a mighty God and a desire to see, to see change. And secondly, they involved God. They involved God. Nehemiah not only sat down and mourned, but the Bible says he fasted and prayed. Esther said, Go and tell Mordecai, gather all the Jews, fast for three days, 
without hamburger, without food, no chicken wings. Fast for three days, no food. Then I will go. Friends, often the calling it to which God has called us is way beyond our capacities, way beyond our knowledge. If we feel confident to do it, don't do it. You will do it with your force and with your power. How much I cried when God revealed to us and when I said yes and my family to go back to Congo. God, I can do nothing. The situation is bad over there. Lord, send someone else. I'm okay in Kenya, Nairobi. We are training people for the whole of Africa. Send somebody else. Don't you see what I'm doing here? Faith, mighty faith, looks to God alone, sees the promises of God, and says, it shall be done. I wish I was in an African church and someone would say, Amen. Amen. <laughs> Faith in God says, Enough is enough. <laughs> it's time to change. We cannot let our daughters and our mothers be raped and overly raped. We cannot allow that. We must do something. We cannot let our families and our communities be in the hand of the devil. Enough is enough. God, come. God, we want to see change. Friends, with yes to God and with such a prayer, We become crazy, crazy for God, and ready for action. Nehemiah went to Jerusalem to rebuild. Esther went to the king and got what she wanted for her people. Often we evangelicals hide behind prayer. Oh, the situation is bad in Congo. Let's pray about it. I believe me, we have to continue to pray. But we must act too. Often, when God calls us, we say, no, God, you did not call me. Let me just pray. No, God, you don't want me to get involved in this situation. Sometimes we use prayer as a fridge. We take the things and we put them in the fridge so that it will not be rotten. But no action. I'm happy to say that uh, today we have over 500 students at the Christian University of Congo. Our goal is to take Congo back where it belongs, under the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our school is bilingual, very reflective, very strong in service learning so that every theor theory studied in class ends up in social research in the community and the application in the community. We do not want theories that end in a library. We want theories to inform us and change our country. Our students write theses that are directly responding to the challenges of our country. 
The government has taken notice of that and has asked us to start a new curriculum for higher education that will be implemented in the whole of Congo. We have an opportunity with the Lord to change a whole nation. I'm happy to see the involvement of this institution in what we are doing through your professors who have helped us to review the curriculum, to work alongside us, to have workshop on learning and faith. Grateful for students who have come from here and helped teach social research, helped in our computer lab, and many other things. Friends, this is not about Congo. This is about the people of God. This is not about us only. It is about you and us together. The people, young Americans who are spending time with us, they learn what, excuse me to say it, Witten cannot teach them. Real life and the application of Christianity in challenging context. And they learn to pray in a new way and to see God in a new way. What are you studying for? What is your dream? Don't let it be just an American dream. Make it a God dream. Let's pray. This is our prayer, dear Lord, for such a time as this, that these young people will rise up to the opportunity of their world and be the people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.